Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last paper in the session is um, now, again, moving away from mobile. Now we are focusing on more laptops or, let's say, every device where we need encrypted RAM. So the presentation will be by Lian Jin Zhao from Concordia University on HypnoGuard, protecting secrets across sleep-wake cycles. Welcome. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon. Thanks for staying for this talk. Um, thanks for the instruction. My name is uh, Lian Ying. Me and Dr. Mohammed Manan, we're from Concordia University, Canada. Um, before I start, uh, could you please let me know, um, over the past 48 hours, how many of you have ever had your laptop in sleep? If you happen to bring, yeah, okay, good. So let me get started. Um, okay, so I'd like to start with talking about uh, the life cycle of user data. I believe all of you have all sorts of data stored on computing devices, and then you may have uh, the notions of data in transit, data at rest, and data in use. And since decades ago, I've been uh, protecting the data in transit, which refers to the information in network communications. So nowadays, we have uh, various security protocols like SSL, uh, TLS, IPsec, and so forth. And regarding data at rest, which refers to the files stored on persistent storage like hard drives, um, it's a bit straightforward to protect them because they're not actively accessed or used by the CPU, so we can simply um, encrypt them with either partial or full disk encryption. Um, for data in use, it will be a bit trickier because um, we can never feed encrypted instructions to CPU. Even if we can encrypt the memory, somehow at a certain point we have to decrypt it before it gets to CPU. And depending on the threat model, we can also store the secrets at an alternative place, which I'll um, explain a bit more later. But at this point, we still believe there's something missing, as we just saw. So that is data in sleep. So the term by itself may sound a bit weird, but it does exist. And we argue that we have to bridge the gap. By sleep, we refer to the ACPI state S3, where all the power-hungry uh, components are turned off, preserving only the contents in RAM. You may not argue with me against the prevalence of sleep mode, as like whoever you have just raised hand just now, but you may say, I don't believe it makes any difference as compared with powered off devices. Well, the answer actually, it, it does, and the difference is your plain text secrets or potentially uh, sensitive information in RAM. Let's say, for example, if you uh, use certain FDE tools like TrueCrypt, you have to maintain the plain text master key in memory somehow for it to function, uh, function properly, like encrypting and decrypting data on the fly. And this problem is kind of intrinsic. Uh, you cannot easily avoid. And we have a whole bunch of tools to extract secret information from memory. Even other than that, in addition, we have those side channel attacks exemplified by the DML attacks, the code boot attack. So the code boot attack um, makes use of the remnants property of SRAM or DRAM modules with something like, uh, like liquid nitrogen. Uh, you can significantly and rapidly lower uh, the temperature of the RAM module and then remind it to another machine for retrieving data. And in DM attacks, you just simply exploit uh, probably a vulnerable uh, protocol stack to directly access memory without CPU's intervention. So in all these cases, there is a big problem. Okay, so before going too far, I'd like to first clarify what kind of tr uh, problem we're trying to solve. Um, we want to prevent the extraction of uh, memory resident secrets in the case of coercion, loss, or theft through side channel attacks when the system is in sleep mode. Keep in mind that your secrets could be anywhere in memory. 
We have to emphasize the coercion laws or theft situations because in those cases, the adversary has physical access so that he can perform uh, all these kinds of uh, side channel attacks. And we want to uh, consider devices regained from these situations are not trusted anymore, not to be continued to be used. <clears throat> that is out of scope. OK. So then let's see what makes this problem so special. That is, when the system wakes up, your secret is already there. And actually, it's been always there, no matter how strong your additional authentication is. The adversary just doesn't have to go through the authentication process. He can simply perform the side channel attacks I just mentioned. Then, is that to say this is brand new domain to consider? Definitely not, as you may be aware of. There have been certain solutions or potential solutions around from both the academia and the industry. They generally fall into uh, two categories, uh, the uh, encryption-based and relocation-based. Um, if, if you can tolerate certain kind of architectural modification, you may go for this uh, encrypted uh, execution like ZOM, which keeps the memory content always encrypted before uh, it gets to the CPU to get executed. But intuitively, you may think this kind of modified hardware is less feasible in reality. Then if you look at the uh, like commercially available hardware, we also have uh, Intel SGX. So in addition to all the other purposes, um, it does uh, encrypt the enclaved memory properly before it gets executed. Um, it's a good job, but in our setting, we also consider it have to, to have some uh, restrictions or limitations. For example, it only targets user, uh, user space applications. It doesn't even run system level uh, uh, codes or pr uh, protections. And I will expand on that later. Uh, if you look at the relocation based ones, as I mentioned earlier, you may choose to uh, store the secrets in an alternative place like in CPU registers, as it's been done by Trezor, in CPU cache, as in Kopker, or even in uh, graphical cars, as uh, Pixel Vault. And some of them really work well to achieve the purposes I just mentioned, but there are always limitations among them. Okay, they can be very, or some of them can be very application specific. For example, pr protecting only one or a few keys for hard drive encryption. So it cannot be generalized to other uh, applications. Or even if some of them can be generalized, they involve per application changes, which will be very unlikely to be adopted by the developers. And even if all the problem can be solved, still you just consider how, how much data you can consider to be protected in CPU cache or in CPU registers. It could be very, just little, probably bytes or kilobytes. Okay, so to better address this problem, we propose HypnoGuard. We named this tool HypnoGuard because Hypnos in, in Greek mythology is the god of sleep. And that's actually where we want to guard the secrets. OK, so let's see uh, what HypnoGuard can do. It performs a quick, in place, full memory encryption to protect any size of your secrets in any location with the hardware-bound user re-authentication. So the secret is not released to anybody in any environment. When certain conditions are satisfied, we can also trigger a secure, stealthy deletion of the secret or the key protecting the secret, with the, uh, which is uh, cryptographically verifiable. 
and let's break them down. So HypnoGuard is quick, as quick as approximately one second for a system with eight gigs, uh, eight gigs RAM. And the re-authentication process is hardware bound. So we choose to use a very strong uh, encryption key for encrypting the RAM data and storing the key in TPM. And this protection is bound to the environment, so the key can only be released in the right genuine environment. I will get to that very soon. And also, uh, in the case of uh, coercion or guessing attacks, a verifiable deletion can be triggered promptly and stealthily. And let me just expand more on hardware binding for better understanding of the detailed design in the next page. So by storing the key in TPM, we actually refer to two, uh, two kinds of uh, protections. First, it is the, the access password typed by the user. Uh, <clears throat> the second one is environment measurement. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys must be uh, familiar with how uh, TPM and TXT works, but just for your information, this kind of uh, measurement uh, can be started at a certain point. This is called DRT TRTM. So from that point on, any binary being loaded into memory and executed must be measured by the previous stage. And the first stage starts with the CPU, which is not compromisable. And this way, this measurement, it's kind of, it's forming a chain, measure, chain measurement from the beginning to the point where HypnoGuard is loaded. It's in the form of T, uh, TPM registers. It's called platform configuration registers as uh, hash values. Okay, now let's take a look at the detailed design. Um, at the provisioning time, there are uh, two keys or a, a pair of keys generated for HypnoGuard, which is the HGPub and HGPrive. The HGPrive, the private key, never leaves uh, CP, uh, TPM. So it's stored here, represented by yellow, as I just explained about the uh, hardware binding. And the public part, the public key, uh, is available outside on the top, which you can always access. And each time before entering sleep, um, a strong symmetric key, SK, is generated. It is a procession key. With this key, we, we encrypt the whole memory on the top in blue very quickly, as I mentioned just a, about a second. And SK is encrypted using the public key on the top and erased from memory right away. At this point, the only way to retrieve the, the whole memory data, to, to decrypt them, is to unlock HGPrive or to release HGPrive. But this, as I mentioned, involves both the user tapped password and the platform measurement, which is in the form of PCR. And you may notice the design of combining um, both the symmetric key system and the public key system. Uh, the benefit is that, you know, symmetric key system is very fast, so we have to make use of that to achieve fast encryption. And other than that, we need to uh, minimize, minimize uh, the impact on usability. So with this public key, we can always encrypt the SK without user intervention. And the user is required to type the password only at the wake up time. And then as you can see on the top, in the blue region, we can have secrets in both uh, application, uh, like user space and the kernel space. So there's a very small portion of memory, like three megabytes reserved for HypnoGuard. And, um, there are also some regions not encryptable, like uh, mapped I.O. space. Okay. I won't jump into the specific, like technical specifics, but I will briefly describe the workflow. As you can see on the left, uh, 
HypnoGuard has to hook the S3 event so that it can be triggered when the user initiates a sleep mode, either by closing the lid of a laptop or uh, pressing the power button. And this is the only place where uh, we're not OS independent. So I have to develop a driver to, uh, like for the corresponding operating system. And after that, when uh, HypnoGuard is in control, it gets outside of the, the operating system, and then it can like freely encrypt the whole memory without interference from the operating system. At the wake up time, the user, uh, we have to first enter TXT. As I mentioned, the, the trusted execution environment, the user is prompted for the password. Depending on what the password is, we either uh, issue, uh, initiate the secure deletion or we release the key uh, stored in TPM to uh, resume the operating system, to decrypt the, 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 mem the memory data. Okay, so you might be wondering uh, how we can achieve uh, prompt full memory encryption. There are a few factors to be con considered and none of, the, none of them could be missing. First, we have to make use of uh, the, the, the uh, new uh, instruction set, AESNI, to, uh, for a hardware acceleration. Um, it has to be done in TXT in a native way. And also, we have to make full use of all the CPU cores. This is the multiple core processing. And also, the mode of operation matters, which I'll explain soon. Regarding the uh, unlocking uh, policies, so this is about when a password is typed by the user received by HypnoGuard, how to react on different passwords. So to address coercive situations, the user can choose to use the deletion password, and in normal operations, he can choose to use the unlocking password. In our current implementation, we chose to use the stack at static policy, so these passwords are predefined. And to address um, gassing attacks, uh, we also apply this fail counter. It's just like the regular rate limiting mechanisms online, uh, online, like online services. Um, when you exceed a predefined threshold, the deletion will be triggered the same way as if a deletion password has been entered. Other than that, in the future, we may also consider to incorporate dynamic schemes, for example, regular expression-based, uh, pattern-based, and so forth. And more on to the modes of op operation. So for now, uh, we, we chose to use uh, the AES counter mode. And the counter mode is satisfactory in terms of performance. Um, uh, as I mentioned, it achieves like eight gigs per second. Um, but although we don't consider regained device should be trusted, still, in some cases, we may say, uh, what if the attacker uh, stealthily um, manipulates the data uh, unbeknownst to the, uh, the user? Uh, what can we do to further address that issue? So to provide another layer of protection, we um, adapted the original construction of GCM. You know, GCM is another mode of operation of AES, which achieves uh, authenticity. And you will see uh, we, we have to make this kind of adaptation uh, for a satisfactory uh, performance. Okay, so I just said uh, CTR achieve the satisfactory performance, and it's uh, both its uh, decryption and encryption operations are symmetric. So that's why we have the same, almost the same numbers for encryption and decryption. And uh, you will see the unmodified construction of GCM, just the, this column on the right. Uh, it's very asymmetric, so the Performance for encryption is kind of fine, but the decryption is much slower. So we chose to uh, 
You know, the regular decryption process for GCM, it has to go through the data blocks twice for tag verification. So in our case, because we can uh, disconcern uh, um, even after the data has been decrypted, if we find any anomaly, we can just abort. So it doesn't matter that we defer the tag verification phase. Uh, no, no, not defer. Defer means we combine the tag verification together with the decryption process. So it just has to go through data blocks, the blocks once. This way, we make the performance a little bit better, so it's very close to that of uh, encryption. Okay. Um, other than that, as always, we encounter a lot of implementation challenges, but among them, I have to point out that we believe we're the first to address the issue of wake-up time user interaction. I don't know if you're aware of this, but as documented uh, in the previous paper, uh, the user had to type the password to a black screen. So that's the peculiarity of the wake-up time, because we don't have uh, the device driver support from the operating system as in runtime. We don't have the support from BIOS or UEFI at the uh, boot time. So you will see at the wake up time from S3, everything is uninitialized, including the PCI configuration space uh, whatsoever. So we have to do a lot of things to, to play the trick, which is already explained in the paper. And here are a list of uh, related work or solutions. Um, I won't go through all of them, but here I just need to make the comparison between HypnoGuard and BitLocker. Um, so actually, it, it seemingly achieves the same purpose uh, without per application changes. No uh, third-party trusted servers rely, uh, required um, uh, with hardware binding. And, but, the tricky thing here is that BitLocker forces the device to enter S3, which is hibernation. So it's actually equivalent to power off. Every time you go back to your uh, laptop, it has to uh, boot up and then reread the, 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 uh, the data from hard drive. Even if it's the fast SSD, still it couldn't get like uh, faster than eight seconds. And on average, it's more than 10 seconds or even 20 seconds. So that's definitely inaccept unacceptable for usability. And that actually undermines the purpose of sleep mode. Okay, so there is something uh, more to be further discussed. For example, as I mentioned, Intel SGX, we could consider uh, adapting uh, HypnoGuard to use to make use of SGX, and SG, SGX by itself is just a primitive. It doesn't replace HypnoGuard. It may potentially complement um, TXT, but as I mentioned, it's just uh, targeting user space applications, as in cloud computing environments. So it could be tricky to um, just uh, reuse it. And also, if you consider system with larger RAM. Um, in addition to the fact that with the larger RAM, most likely the CPU will have a much better computing power, we also provide certain variants that only encrypt part of the memory as requested by the user. So that could be a trade-off for a huge RAM but like a low computing power CPU. And also, as I mentioned about re achieving OS independence, uh, we only require a very tiny, uh, sorry, uh, device driver to be developed for the corresponding operating system. Other than that, it's all, uh, OS independent. In summary, we propose HypnoGuard, which, which uh, encrypts the full memory um, just in a second. And uh, we require no pre-application changes, no online third-party servers, and also the user's experience in sleep mode is preserved. So that's all about the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, OK, so we have time for some questions. Hi, Vio. Thanks for the, uh, for the nice talk. Could you say a bit more about how you provide the uh, protection against password guessing? Okay. So 
as I mentioned just now about the uh, unlocking schemes, it's actually very similar to a previous no uh, notion of panic passwords or duress code. So either if, oh sorry, it's about password guessing. So either by guessing the adversary happens to hit the deletion password, which triggers deletion, or he's trying too many attempts so that it exceeds the threshold uh, that is set as the a fail counter, then deletion will be triggered the same way. And also, uh, in addition, just to clarify, here, this guessing prevention is in the context of HypnoGuard, a benign, genuine environment of HypnoGuard. As I mentioned, if you uh, bypass HypnoGuard, so you can just load whatever software of your choice, then it will never uh, retrieve the, the, the key, it will never unlock the key from TPM, then because of the long the high entropy SK, you're guessing it's like brute forcing a long secret like 128 bits key. So that kind of offline guessing is also prevented. Thanks. Hi, Sergio from Stanford. Uh, just a quick question. Do you do any kind of integrity checking on the data? Uh, yeah, I think that's about the, as I mentioned, about the adapted GCM mode, because if we use the counter mode, it doesn't provide integrity. But with GCM, you know, it's, uh, it's chained and there's a tag verification phase. So if um, by any chance the data is manipulated by the attacker, it could be detected. Sure, yeah, I'm in the counter mode. You don't do anything extra to add integrity? Uh, for now, but uh, it can be done. Okay. It's just like we try to separate the two uh, flavors of HypnoGuard. So one with uh, the counter mode, one with the GCM mode. Got it, cool. Thanks. Thanks. from Austrian Institute of Technology. Um, so, um, it, yeah, very, I think the, the work is very sound. And just actually, my question is, uh, yeah, uh, so security is all about the risk. So I see like uh, this kind of solution can easily be probably done by some, some technology company in the food chain, up in the food chain. But uh, yeah, have you, have you thought about what's the risk of uh, attacks uh, on the data in sleep, as you say? Uh, what is the risk? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, you know, a strong adversarial model is a physical threat. For example, you may have uh, highly sensitive data stored on your uh, laptop, and it's actually when you just uh, randomly close the, the lid of the laptop, it's in sleep mode, and then whatever secrets you have is just in memory. If it gets stolen or lost, I mean, it, the risk depends on your business. If it's highly important, the risk is obvious. Or, in the case of coercion, as I mentioned, it's kind of extreme, but if you happen to be an intelligence agent crossing the border of a like, hostile country or you're captured, and then you also have to initiate secure, secure deletion, I'd be known to the adversary. You cannot just have access to your laptop anymore physically. So that could be another scenario. So there's no really, say, study on how, what, what kind of... Oh, you mean the statistics? Yeah. Um, well, we, we consider... Uh, such kind of risks to be obvious. Uh, um, like, if you have a high chance to um, get your laptop in sleep mode and it could fall in the wrong hands, then the risk just depends on how important your data is. And then that's out of scope, right? Thank you. Thanks. Hi there, I'm Martin Dunnawad from University of Oxford. Um, you mentioned that you use multi-cores to yes. speed it up. I forgive my lack of understanding about the Intel multi-core architecture, but does each core have its own ASNI functionality? Uh, sure, sure. Is it, there only one per processor? And, and if so, how does that split? Okay. It doesn't have to be split because the ASNI is just a new instruction set. It's like, just like regular uh, instructions. So they, they're not uh, like... Uh, mutually exclusive. So you have one core uh, executing these instructions. You can feel free to execute the same instruction on the other core, given that the, uh, the target data you're operating on does not overlap. Because in our case, we just do native uh, manual uh, multi-core processing. So we just split the data regions um, like evenly so that they don't overlap with each other. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, just one question. So let's say um, I have my laptop with eight gigabytes, then I put it in sleep mode, leave it in sleep mode for 12 hours or something. Do random bit flips occur that would then prevent the decoding? Uh, that's an interesting question. Actually, um, I have heard of it. I'm, I'm aware of this, but uh, statistically, I don't see um, any, uh, I would say, evidence in reality that it does happen. But there might be a chance, even in this case, um, it won't be worse than like, without HypnoGuard. Like if you, if you happen to see that, and then it happens to be like, a very critical region of the operating system, when you go back from sleep, probably your system will crash. And that doesn't involve any uh, security implications, actually. Hope that. OK. So thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and this also